Chamber of the 100 Black Men of the Bay Area. This is the second time that we're hosting this particular event. As demand has been extremely high, as you can look around and see, to have these type of conversations. When you look at the demographics of many of the companies in Silicon Valley, you'll notice that a lot of people of color aren't well represented. As an Oakland native, I know what our people are capable of. And I refuse to believe that we lack the drive, the passion, or the intelligence to have successful careers at Bay Area tech companies. Many of people of color don't look to tech companies for jobs because they can't code. And there's an assumption that you work at a tech company, you must know how to code. And that's false. And many tech companies don't have the access to the networks so that way they can connect to, to uh, Bay Area people of color to the positions that they have open. So putting these two groups together was the impetus for this panel. And it's my life's goal to make sure that our people have the access and the information they need to be successful. This is the final panel of a three-part series that was preceded by panels on how to launch your own startup. And then a second panel was on how to get financing from venture capitalists and angel investors. This series is the byproduct of a mission to increase access, improve economics in black and brown communities. We're going to get started in a moment. I'm going to introduce our esteemed panelists. I'll ask them a set of questions. Then we'll open it up for the audience to ask questions. And then we'll conclude. But first, we have some house rules. We have a lot to discuss tonight, and I want to get straight to it, but we got to get over these house rules, all right? So I'm going to ask the panelists a set of preset questions. And then after that, we're going to talk about some other things. But we got to go over these rules because they're, they're quite important, all right? Rule number one for anyone asking a question. You must actually have a question. <laughs> this is not the forum to make a point about the tech industry in general, to show off your knowledge on a particular topic, or to make random comments in general. While those things have a place, it's not here tonight. <laughs> Second rule, during the panel discussion, please take the time to think about, codify, and formulate your question. Your question should not take more than 15 seconds to state. The more concise you are, the more likely it is that you will give your fellow audience members the opportunity to ask questions as well. So please be courteous and considerate of your fellow audience members. Lastly, and this is pretty important as well, if you come up to the mic to ask our panelists a question, please do not ask them about your individual resume that you submitted to their company <laughs> some time ago. They got a lot of people looking at them, and I don't want them turning red trying to figure out a way to let you know that they don't keep track of every resume that comes to the company. So you can save that, those questions for after the panel, and you can talk to the folks from their, from their companies. A um, few other things, we have bathrooms right behind this uh, white wall and to the left, and then you know, men, men and women uh, bathrooms are that way, and then unisex restrooms are upstairs. All right, you guys ready to get started? I'm going to begin introducing our panelists in alphabetical order. And so first up, we have Matthew Alexander. <laughs> Matthew, or Matt as he prefers to be called, grew up on the south side of Chicago and moved to LA during his last year of high school. He went to school for film and has been a film editor for the last eight years. Most notably, he's an editor on a film called 20 Feet from Stardom, which won a Grammy and Academy Award. He now works in tech as a sales rep for Ellie Mae. He also helps with a nonprofit called the Springboard Initiative, a program focused on the development of young African Americans in the tech industry. It's a nine-month training and six-month job apprenticeship program. He also runs an affinity group at Ellie Mae called the Millennial Group, which focuses on the recruitment and retainment of the millennial age employees at Ellie Mae. Let's give him one more round of applause. Next up, Glenn Medow. <laughs> Glenn's utopian world is a home where his kids love and respect one another, do their chores and homework, absent a single reminder, and they cherish family time as much as YouTube or Instagram. <laughs> as a talent acquisition professional with more than 20 years of experience, he's worked with notable companies such as Sybase, Informatica, 
Electronic Arts, EA, Adobe, and currently AppDynamics. His claim to fame occurred around 1999 when a relatively little known company from the South Bay boasted of having the best search engine in the world. After tactfully dismissing the fledgling startup for what was then the premier online search engine, Axe Jeeves, he realized the gravity of that decision when Google's IPO went a few years later. When he's not busy finding purple squirrels or building companies, you can find him in the kitchen cooking a family meal along with the perfect, uh, finding the perfect bottle of wine or a beer to pair. Let's give it up for Glenn. <laughs> up next, we have Rochelle Nadiri. <laughs> Rochelle translates complex ideas into simple language. She uses this and other skills as a policy communi communications manager at Facebook, where she works with cross-functional teams to help people understand Facebook's commitment to privacy. Prior to Facebook, Rochelle was senior media manager, media relations manager, global marketing communications with Black and Viach. Did I get that right? Veach, Veach, like bleach with beach. All right. <laughs> a global company that works on critical energy water and utility infrastructure around the world. She was also a manager in Burst and Marsteller's Issues and Crisis Group. Oops. Yes, indeed. Where she specialized in crisis management, opposition research, and message development. Rochelle began her career on the staff of a now retired representative, Steve Israel, New York Vogue 2. Her clients have included Dow Chemical, Accenture, HP, Merrill Lynch, Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, Ford, GlaxoSmithKline, and pretty much the whole world. Let's give it up for Rochelle. <laughs> Last but most definitely not least, we have Emit Panja. <laughs> give your room to shine. Emit <laughs> is a senior manager in talent acquisition at Medallia, leading. <laughs> all right. It's getting real. <laughs> Leading talent efforts for all general and administrative GNA positions, as well as Medallia's university program. However, his experience in talent at Medallia has run the gamut from professional services to products to engineering. Prior to Medallia, Amit spent almost a decade practicing corporate law and running a small but mighty corporate mediation and executive coaching shop in New York. He received his JD from Columbia University and his BA from the University of Mix Michigan. Let's all give it up for a minute. And so now we'll get started with our panel. So first and foremost, what positions at your organizations are open that don't involve coding? Hi. Yeah, so uh, App Dynamics. Um, uh, is hiring a number of diff, uh, variety of roles from marketing to legal, uh, finance, uh, customer success, which is uh, primarily the post-sales side of the house, uh, in addition to um, sales, um, IT as well. Um, similarly, Facebook, uh, people don't normally think about it as a traditional company, but we are. So any position that you would think of at a bank, or even at the library, we have it there. So that is also sales, HR, recruiting, recruiting for recruiting, <laughs> finance if you're from the East Coast, um, and anything else that you can think of, facilities, real estate, anything. So please, please, if you are interested, the team is in the back, talk to us because we wanna hear from you. Okay, hi everybody. Um, yeah, uh, similarly to, to my colleagues up here, uh, you know, we are hiring across finance, uh, legal, uh, people and culture, uh, workplace services, IT, marketing. Uh, I mean, really, the world is your oyster, Medallia. Yeah, i definitely say the same, <laughs> honestly. Uh, but I know we just opened up a bunch of new positions, maybe like a few in education, uh, some in sales coming up. Um, mostly coding, but also, um, but yeah, sales, um, I would say marketing as well. So I think finance as well. Thank you. So what makes a candidate stand out when applying for these positions? Michelle, you wanna start us off? 
Yeah, um, you have to want to build and make impact. It's really, I know I'm going to sound several times tonight like I'm drinking the Kool-Aid and serving it, but it's really true. Um, even when I interviewed, because it's easier to tell a story about myself, right? Um, I, it, was, it involved several conversations with folks from recruiting, trying to find what a good fit for me would be um, and what a good fit for Facebook would be. And I found that quite refreshing, right? Because sometimes when you want to apply for a job, you think, gosh, the way it's described, it really doesn't fit me. Or when you talk to a recruiter, they're asking a specific set of questions that might not speak to your lived experience. And in my experience at Facebook, we really try to look at your whole person and do you meet our values, right? Do you want to make impact? Do you want to be bold? Do you want to do something good socially? And do you want to change things? And have you done that in your life? So if, as you're thinking about any job and applying to any position, think about whether it's a fit for you as well and a fit for the company. Otherwise, we can do all the recruiting all we want. You can come, you can start, and you're going to hate it. And it's going to be a waste of time. Uh, plus one to all of that. Fantastic. I absolutely agree. Um, just something in addition, one thing when I look at a resume, I want to see a point of view. I think so often uh, someone applies for a role and, and they haven't really laid out for me you know, why they want this job. And, and to be honest, I am so willing to believe anything you say as long as I know that, that you've thought about it, you know, that, that you have a point of view that, that actually speaks directly to this job. Once that happens, I'm more than happy to have a conversation and, and move you forward through the process. So um, I'd like to take a, a little different approach uh, to that. Um, when you come through the door, I'm going to assume that you've met all the prerequisite skill sets, knowledge, skills, abilities. What I would challenge everybody to sort of think about is um, whether or not you understand the culture of the company, right? Um, you have to understand your own personality and determine whether or not those two things match. Um, if you're the type who uh, needs to have things happen immediately, now, go, 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 and you attempt to join a company that does not facilitate that type of culture, then, then you're trying to fit that square peg into a round hole. So um, really do your research, understand who you are as a person, and then try to do your best to match that with the culture of the company. So it's all about research. Yeah, I think uh, you, hit the, you hit the nail right on the head there. Um, the only thing that I would add to that is probably building uh, personal relationships with the recruiters. Um, I know when people go the extra mile to kind of reach out more than once, more than twice, um, just really building out a solid foundation, uh, the recruiter will go the extra mile for you. So I've seen that work really well, just, just talking to the recruiter as much as you possibly can. Thank you. So we have a... Um a mixture of ages in the audience here tonight. And there's a perception that millennials uh, make up most of the workforce in most tech companies. Are tech companies open to hiring people that don't fall in that demographic? Yeah, so uh, most definitely. You know, we've, we've done a number of uh, sort of analytics on um, the, the demographics of our company. Um, and, you know, we, we try to do uh, what we need to do in order to balance that demographic out. Uh, we hire, number one, based um, on experience um, and the ability to get the job done. A little bit of drive and persistence is really what's going to get you in front. Um, and, you know, everyone that we look at, again, we, as I said earlier, um, we assume that you, you've, you've already fulfilled the prerequisites. What we're looking for is someone who has that persistence uh, that, that will fit the culture of the company. I'll just add another P word to that. Um, we're looking for perspective, right? So there are grandparents that work at Facebook, right? There are parent parents that work on Facebook. I'm one of those. Um, and I think the more perspectives you have on a team, the better you are for it, whatever department you're working on, whatever you're trying to produce. And so that's how we look at it. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, we kind of have the reverse uh, at Ellie Mae because we um, are kind of in the mortgage industry as well as the tech industry. So um, for a long time, we hired straight, strictly from the mortgage industry. Um, so now when we're going platform next year and we're doing a couple of things that are a bit more tech related now with the company. Um, so now we're hiring younger. So it's actually a perfect time to be a millennial. And, and so shameless plug. Um, but yeah, if you are a millennial, this would be a great time to actually work at Ellie Mae because we are doing things like uh, paying more attention to our culture, diversity on our teams, um, especially age diversity because there was definitely, it was definitely top heavy. So that's why I, I run a millennial group at a tech company is that usually is not a thing, right? But there's definitely a thing at Ellie Mae and we're definitely paying attention to that right now. 
Yes, uh, that, that, that's the answer. Um, I think the underlying uh, assumption there is that yes, there is sort of ageism like within the tech industry, and to say there isn't is a lie. It's, it's absolutely a lie. There's bias in tech industry, of course there is. One thing that I think you know we probably are all doing, I mean, is partnering with, with different organizations, uh, internal and external, in order to change bias as it stands. Um, I know that's happening at Medali. I'm sure it's happening where you guys are. I've actually been, I've heard of programs um, at your institutions. So um, I feel like I'm in good company. So I heard P words. I heard harassment. You know, <laughs> what 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 can an applicant do um, to make their resume stand out? I'll, I'll take a stab at that first. Um, the, my initial response is therein lies the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, when you're at a point where you're networking and you're networked with the right people, um, you'll never have to send a resume again in your life. All right. Um, so I'd urge you again to really understand what you're getting into. Know, uh, you know what your uh, core skill sets are uh, that align with not only the job but the company itself. Um, totally, totally with that. I'm just gonna keep you know agreeing with everything people say. So whatever. Um, but I think there's something to be said about. Um, you know, the percentage of our hires that actually come from inbound applications uh, is fairly low. You know, I think it's like maybe 15 or 20 percent. Uh, 45 to 50 comes from uh, referrals. Um, I think another, maybe 30, I'm now making things up. 30 comes from, uh, from sourcing, et cetera. Um, I think just submitting a resume uh, and expecting a response as a matter of course. Uh, I think we're at the day and age where so many resumes come into every tech company. It's, it's hard to even know if your resume is going to be, be looked at. Um, one thing I encourage in order to get your resume looked at is actually to send it to directly to a recruiter. Uh, it is our job, ours up here and you know my friends in the back, to actually bring people in, not keep, a pe ah, keep people out. Uh, so yeah, find me, send me your resume, I'd be more than happy to chat. I'm going to, I'm going to diverge from some of the things that were said right here for a little bit. Um, one of the reasons why we have events like this is because some folks do not have the networks that other people traditionally have. Um, you'd be surprised at how many people just apply to Facebook and get interviews. So not to just be, do not be discouraged if you want to apply at the careers page. Please do so. Our recruiters work very, very hard to make sure that we're managing the expectations of both the applicants and the business people that we're beholden to, right? And accounting for the fact that, you know what, maybe I didn't go to school with a certain person, or maybe I don't know a certain person that can even connect me to an event like this. So to the extent that you are unafraid to just apply, we can sort the rest out. So don't feel like you cannot. It is better to have a network and to have a referral, but that doesn't mean that straight applications do not help. Thank you, thank you. Let's follow up on that and ask, what can an applicant do to make themselves stand out in an interview? Be curious, ask questions. We love when people not only want to, to join our company, but want to add something to our company. And, and we know there's something to add when, when they're curious about things, when they're, when they're creative about things, when they're strategic about things. And we see that during an interview, oh my gosh, we wanna keep them coming back. So, so absolutely, just, just be curious. I would also say, add, to add to that, asking questions, ask personal questions, maybe not too personal, <laughs> but build out a relationship uh, with the people you are interviewing. Um, get to know, you know, maybe their family dynamic, uh, where they're from. Maybe you connect and you know, like the same foods or build out whatever that is. Um, and then they will always remember you. And I feel like once they feel like they have a connection with you, they'll go that extra mile for you as well. So how important is it to know someone within the organization that you're applying to? Is that is that crucial? Uh, I, w I wouldn't say crucial, um, but it does help, right? Like, um, I was speaking at a panel maybe a month or two ago, and I just told everybody in the room to email me their resumes, and only one person did, right? But that person just started his first day yesterday, right? So it take the initiative, right? Um, but it's not as important, but it definitely, I mean, I went the extra mile for him just because he was the only person to do it. Right. Reminder, send in your resumes. All right, 
So I've heard that it's good for an applicant to actually research a company, to know about the company. So what, what, what does that look like? I mean, research, you know, I, I, I know your mission, and I know your CEO, and I know three years ago you got in trouble for your diversity numbers. What, what else is there to look for? <laughs> so I, I would um, advise um, candidates to think about um, one thing. Um, if, if you're interviewing for some of the companies that are out here, uh, Facebook, um, Uber, you know, these are brand companies. Um, when we have folks come into AppDynamics, AppDynamics doesn't carry that same brand impact. Um, my question to candidates is, all right, so you've, you've taken the opportunity to um, get interviews at these brand name companies, and now you're coming to AppDynamics. Why? Right? I need to understand why the shift from a uh, well-known brand to a somewhat um, behind-the-scenes type so, uh, uh, company that um, you're not going to go home and talk to your family or friends about because, frankly, they're not quite sure what AppDynamics does or is, yeah. right? Um, so I need to understand, and I need you to sell me on, on the research that you've done and basically get me to the point where I, I think, yes, I, I think you get it. You, you understand, and I know why you're interviewing with us as well as these other companies. I would say um, to think about what problem you're trying to solve, right? We have a variety of roles, and when you walk in, uh, you may have one in mind. If you've made it to the interview process, there is one in mind. One of the questions that I ask when I interview people uh, for roles on the policy team is, what have you heard about us? Um, if, it's been, if there was a controversy, how would, what how would you have done differently? Um, what did you like about what we did? Um, what do you see coming down to pike? This shows what, how people are thinking about the role and how much they understand about what the role entails. While you can never super communicate everything that's going to happen and every turn that's going to take with a particular role, you can really establish an understanding of what you need and what you can do as an outsider looking in. And even that perspective is sometimes helpful to us as interviewer, to know what people are saying about us, right? Facebook is super huge, and so a lot gets lost in the shuffle. And part of my job is to be really clear about what we're trying to communicate. And if an interviewee comes in applying for a role and isn't clear on what we're trying to communicate, I haven't done my job. One thing that I think is just incredibly impressive to hear during an interview is also something that plays towards the longevity of someone within Medallia, and that is being aligned to the mission. Um, I think that's kind of a part of what you guys were saying as well, but there's something to be said about knowing that what a company does is something that you can get behind, such that as it grows, you know, every time a company goes by 20%, there's some sort of reorg. There's a shift in the strategy towards meeting that mission, but the mission does stay the same. We know that, that you'll be behind it, that you'll be sticking around, and that you'll be, you'll be enjoying the ride. I agree. So here's a question. Um, we see a lot of folks who, they, they use Facebook, they use these apps, they use, and they, they want to work there. Listen, you, you can make a lot of, tech, a lot of money at a tech uh, company. That's, that's the rumor on the street. They go on your website, it's seven positions they like. Do they apply for all seven? Is that looked down upon, or should they go for it? Can, what, what, what's the idea behind that? Um, Doris and team can correct me in the back. I do believe there's a three, a limit of three on the side at any given time. Thanks, Angelina. Um, so, it, and it forces you to do a couple of things. It forces you to be really critical about what it is you feel you can add and what Facebook can add to you. And it also saves you time from bouncing around from one opportunity to the other and confusing the teams, to be frank with you. And I just think, honestly, if you're applying for seven positions at a job, think about whether or not you want to do a specific role or whether or not you want to work for a company and make sure you're clear on what it is. Because there are a lot of people that want to work for, for Uber. There are a lot of people that want to work for McDonald's. There are a lot of people that want to work for everywhere. What is it that you want to do? Seven positions are probably not it. Absolutely agreed. <laughs> oh my gosh, I feel like I've been working with you know, so many uh, candidates who are impressive. But it seems like they're throwing pasta at the wall and seeing what's going to stick. Um, you know, I, I think I was mentioning this before that you know, I, I really love when when someone has kind of put some thought into what they want to do, the problem they're trying to solve, if they can get behind the mission, et cetera, and that means that there probably aren't seven roles at the company that actually fit what they want to do. Um, I love that three, three role limit. Uh, Medallia, we're gonna take some notes. Thanks, thanks guys. <laughs> 
Um, I would just add to that that work-life balance is very important. So you don't want to get stuck with a job that you actually hate, even if it's for a company that you might want to work for. Um, so just being very clear about where you want to go in that company and kind of like what play to your strengths um, would be probably my best my best bet there. Got it. So here's a, a more internal question: What's being done at your organizations to make uh, the culture more welcome to diverse candidates once they are hired? Um, ERGs all day. We call them employee resource groups. Um, they are a thing and they work. Uh, we Anything from black at to women at to Hispanic at to whatever group you want. Uh, there's a softball group called Swing Fast and Hit Things. Um, <laughs> and, and it really is a testament. We have Black Leadership Day where they fly in everyone who identifies av as of color from around the world to come and sit for a day of inspiration and leadership and it's amazing. And I've never worked at a company that offers such support for folks once you've been hired, right? Because the second half of the diversity inclusion equation is inclusion. What do you do once people get there to make them want to stay? And I think we do a good job of it, right? Um, every employee resource group is chaired by someone in leadership, so you feel like if there is an issue that needs to be discussed, you have access to the M team to be able to address it directly. Because sometimes we form groups because we don't feel like we have the power within an organization. And we're really well supported within Facebook. We have ERGs as well, and I feel like more are popping up every day. I think the growth from when I started in 2014 from like 250 to now 1,100, I feel like more and more communities are coming together, and, and it's a really wonderful thing. I think another thing that, that we do, we actually have an onboarding program, um, and it usually happens within the first week that someone starts at Medallia, and it's about being unabashedly yourself. We want people to bring their whole selves to work, and we want them to be as much of themselves as they can be. Um, one thing about these onboarding programs is that they are, they're group agnostic, they're age agnostic, seniority agnostic, they're, they're region agnostic, they're, they're people from, from, every war, from every group, from every part of Medallia, and they're all there to be vulnerable, to be as much of themselves as they can be, and I think that, that creates a really, really solid start for anyone. So uh, what we um, uh, have developed is a um, uh, employee journey program. Uh, at App Dynamics, so this is sort of an extension uh, from the candidate experience. Um, you'll find uh, the recruiter meeting you at the door, uh, taking you to breakfast on your first day, uh, and making sure that you get to new hire orientation on time. Uh, then we take you through the uh, uh, a new employee uh, journey, which basically is a check-in on day one, week one, month one, uh, 30, 60, and 90 days out. We want to make sure that your experience at the company is seamless uh, and painless, and you know those questions that you're sort of embarrassed to ask. Hey, where's the bathroom? Um, hey, what time is lunch? Is it okay for me to come in at this or that time? So basically, we're going to be your partner and your friend throughout that journey. Yeah, I just wanted to add to the ERG uh, part because uh, we did it a little bit differently. I mean, Ellie May's been around for maybe like 20 years or so. Um, we just started ERGs probably this year, like actually actually having ERG. So um, it was interesting. Uh, we started with a, a women's group, um, and they had their first event. And I was very curious about starting my own group. And then at the, end of the, at the end of the event, they said, hey, like, you know, if you're interested in starting a group, just let us know. And I was like, are oh, they just handing out groups? I was like, I was like all right. Like, <laughs> I was like, so I took that upon myself to actually, uh, I'm not a leader in, in the organization, so to speak, but I took it on myself to uh, show them that I had leadership qualities. Um, so just taking the initiative and, and starting something of your own uh, really could go a long way, and it, it honestly has in my career, honestly. You are a leader. You are well, leader. metaphorically, oh, no, 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 yeah, but yeah, definitely, definitely I am a leader, but showing them the qualities and standing out and, you know, doing that whole thing, you have to go through that process as a, as a newer in career employee, right? So, yeah. Just one more thing about inclusion. Um, inclusion also means promotion. So when we're thinking about underrepresented groups as well, we're also uh, in, encouraging, even externally and internally, a diverse slate of candidates. So if you'd like to advance in your career within the organization, you will have the chance to do so without feeling like other groups are going to get priority over you. And that's one of the other things that we really operationalize within the organization. Thank you. So that's after they're there. Let's talk about what are your companies doing to increase, increase diversity in hiring? I mean, you're here, and I think that's awesome. 
because this is the best place to be. But besides that, what do you all have going on to help with that? Um, I'm actually like really excited about this, mainly because it, it's funny, like in the past six months, I've seen uh, some of the hiring managers I work with go from a, a position where it's, it's a little bit dubious, <laughs> like if, if they really, if they really are acting with their bias or not, et cetera, to people really taking, uh, taking advantage of the opportunities that we have right now. Um, there, there are several programs that we're actually working with right now uh, in order to bring diverse candidates in. And this is not only, you know, underrepresented minorities, but also uh, people who are a bit more, you know, senior in their life, you know, people who, you know, maybe have taken time off for caregiving, et cetera. Um, three of them, I, if you guys haven't heard of them, You've heard about them now, and I encourage you to work with them because they're really fantastic. Um, one is called Path Forward, and what Path Forward is, it's an opportunity for, for individuals, mostly women, admittedly, um, who have had at least five years of work experience, but have taken two years off, or not two years off, two years away from their professional chosen career in order to be a caretaker for either a child, a parent, et cetera, and they're trying to get back into tech, and sometimes that can be a challenge. Um, so we we're working with them, and, actually, and we actually have have roles that are specifically uh, for that group. Um, we also have, we're working with a group called Year Up, which is uh, for people who maybe haven't uh, gone to college, uh, who are looking for jobs in tech. Um, you know, we actually provide, a tra actually Year Up provides a training program, and then we're able to reap the rewards of these amazing people, all right? Um, and then finally, you know, we have, we work with Breakline, which is a veterans organization uh, that allows, you know, people who have used to be in the military um, and are looking for or, you know, sort of uh, private industry jobs, et cetera, we give them an opportunity as well. Um, I think we see that there is um, value in attacking this from all sides. But before I go into one thing, Doris, can I talk about what we're piloting in comms? Um, oh, hi. Can I talk about a little bit about our internal XFN? <laughs> Yeah, so our team is uh, probably a thorn in Doris's side, but she's like, no, Doris is actually our HR business partner, and she's amazing. Um, and what she works with our team to do is figure out creative ways to get candidates that we either wouldn't ordinarily come across or really just people that are going to be great for us um, that come from un underrepresented groups and get them in front of the hiring manager. So what does that mean? It means every time we have an event or attend a recruiting event, we enforce in the line, like in our talking points, please make sure you focus on diversity. It starts with literally getting the support from the people that are actually hiring. In our interview loops, we're testing sort of how long an interview takes. We're testing building certain programs. I think that's as far as I'll go. <laughs> um, but it was really has to be a commitment from within the organization. And the reason why that happened is because we asked for it. So in order to get programs off the ground where people from the out, that are usually from the outside looking in get an opportunity, it takes the people from the inside saying, hey, I'm an ally, or I want someone that looks like me to work with me, and this is where we find them, right? So that's part one. Part two is making sure that we are spreading the message that anyone can apply. Um, when you do get to the interview, we're not asking you questions like, have you been to the latest regatta? A lot of people don't have exposures to yachts and yacht races, right? So we wanna make sure that we are really making sure that we're not um, uh, biased in any way. And we have actually made our managing bias program public to the entire industry so that everyone can really have a chance to make sure that we're getting the best candidates from the beginning. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll add to that. Our, um, our CEO, he had a uh, vision after he retired last year to create a, uh, a nonprofit, which is the Springboard Initiative that I work with right now, which serves uh, inner city youth in the Bay Area, and it's basically a job training program, right? And so the first part of that is the job training part, where it's a nine month apprentice or a nine month program where you learn pretty much the essentials for what you would need for an entry level job um, at a tech company. Um, the other half of that is there's a six month apprenticeship. Um, where we partner with companies. Um, so right now we have Ellie Mae and we have Visa as our two uh, uh, corporate partners. And once they finish that nine month program, uh, they go to Ellie Mae or Visa for a six month apprenticeship where they have the opportunity to then get hired on full time after that. Um, so, but that had to come from top down, right? So um, we had to really make sure that we aligned with him once he made that 
initiative, and then everybody else kind of jumped on board. So I think once you're researching those companies, you might want to look at kind of the CEO and what their values are. Um, and then from there, you can kind of know if you're a good fit for that place. Yeah, and, and I think, um, you know, a lot of what um, you said, Matt, and, and you as well, um, it, it does have to start from the uh, top down. Um, and then um, really educating um, the hiring managers, not only hiring managers, but um, the hiring teams, the folks who are on the front line interviewing people, trying to understand what unconscious bias is um, and helping them to understand uh, the diversity. So um, ideally we'd want folks to sort of um, uh, do a round table or sync up after each interview to talk about their experience um, and then uh, be able to do sort of a post-mortem um, and really try and understand um, what the purpose and, and continuously remind them. So it's constant messaging about diversity. Can okay, I have one more thing? Um, when you are that hire that comes from a diverse background, it's important to be successful um, because you really open that door for the people who come behind you. Um, so like I said, my, my degree is in film and now I work in sales and tech and I never thought I'd be doing that, right? But the fact that I did that and came in and actually hit the ground running, that definitely opened up things for like the Springboard Initiative, um, like the ERGs, things like that that um, were maybe not thought of. Um, you definitely actually influenced just by being there. Thank you. Um, we're going to ask a few more questions and then we're going to open up to the audience. So if you have a question, again, now is the time to start thinking about it. 15 seconds and you may want to start lining up to the microphones. And just a quick plug, and um, if we encourage you to social media the hell out of this event. So if you do Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever, use the hashtag 100 Tech Careers. We want at least 100 folks to leave here with a new tech career. All right? So here's a question. Um, we talk about reentry folks, you know, who, people who left the workforce and came back in. Um, what about people who, you know, let's just say they started their family young, um, they didn't make it to college, or maybe they only have an associate's degree, and then, you know, but they've been working at an accounting place, for, uh, you know, a mom and pop for 20 years. They, they have a ton of experience, but they don't have the school. They didn't go to the Stanford. They didn't go to Cal. You know, how, how are those folks looked at at your respective companies? Zuck is a dropout. <laughs> I mean, again, can you build something? Have you built something? What can you contribute? What can you give? Your experience should speak for itself. I mean, if you are in the door at the interview, the expectation is you know what we're doing. Yeah, and, and um, keep in mind that when uh, companies hire people, they hire people to solve problems. Right, so understand what the problem is this company is experiencing, uh, tie it into that role, to that job, and then come in with, be prepared to talk about solutions. So be solutions oriented. Over the past few years, we've been trying to push on hiring managers to say, all right, is this, is this really a basic qualification? No, no, it's not a basic qualification to have graduated from college. Is it a basic qualification to have some translatable skills that make you successful in the workplace? Yes, there are many places to get translatable skills, uh, and we are actually implementing structured interviewing in order to, to get to those competencies, as opposed to stop someone from coming in the door because they don't have a bachelor's degree. Uh, just to kind of add to that, I will say that um, it's not as important to have a degree anymore, but I will say understand when you don't have the degree that you do have to go the extra mile. Um, so like the thing I was saying, like getting to know your recruiters better, uh, finding someone on LinkedIn that works at the company, trying to build a relationship there, um, go to events like this, network, um, just to make yourself stand out a bit more, even if you don't pop off the paper, like you know somebody who went to a big school. All right, I'm gonna ask one more question and we're gonna open it up to the audience. So folks start getting ready. Um, quickly, what's one glaring interview pitfall to avoid? What's something you've seen in an interview and it's like, oh my God, I'm definitely not hiring? Uh, turn your phone off. <laughs> Act like you want the job. Sweat. <laughs> a lot of sweat. Wait, is sweat good or sweat bad? <laughs> <laughs> not good. It smells. When someone asks about the benefits package before they ask about anything about the job. Oh, <laughs> so, so to add to that, I, um, when people come in and um, we observe uh, folks, um, 
we know you're nervous, and in some people it shows more than others. So I would even go as far as saying do practice interviews, right? There are jobs out there that will take you in for an interview, practice. Do role plays, right? Uh, role play with friends, family. If you happen to network with folks in HR or recruiters, ask them to interview you, right? No, there's nothing better than actual practice that will put you in the mindset uh, to win in an interview. To, to add to that, I know it's funny with the sweat thing, but uh, the nervousness actually comes through in the interview. So uh, being able to slow yourself down and kind of pace yourself, um, I think practicing actually is a really big key in that. But wanting to come across as your best self, uh, you know, you don't want anything to take away from that because people judge you off a million different things. All right. Any questions from the audience? You have to come. Can we form a line at the microphones? Um, this question is for Matt. Hi. Hi. Uh, how did you transition from film to tech? Because they're very different, and I think there's probably a lot of people here that want to get into this industry that are coming from something that's way off. So what's the best way to do that? The best way to transition uh, from film to tech? Uh, so going, so yes, yeah. So it was, long story short, uh, just but but just going the extra mile. I think I really networked film really well, and that took me to another network that was just business related, right? And so I would just talk to people and have conversations with them. And the more people that you know, you know, like I think opportunities just come your way. And so that was just an opportunity that, that came up in a conversation. It was just like, hey, do you think that you want to, you might want to try this? And I tried it and I was actually good at it, right? And so the opportunities kept coming. So I think just going that extra mile and just networking with as many people in as many industries as you possibly can, um, that really helped me. So may, may I add to that as well? So um, when you're transitioning from industry to industry, there's going to be a cost of opportunity. Uh, you may need to take a look at opportunities that aren't necessarily uh, desirable for you. Get yourself in. Prove yourself, start networking within the company, and then at some point, opportunities will begin to open up. Yeah, and after that, I was started at the bottom, like just so you know, like, like I had the Grammy and the Oscar and all of that, and they literally were just like, here's a six month apprenticeship. Like it was very small, but once you got in, you know, I, I got to do my thing and showed them that I could actually do it. I would also say that um, it's important to play up the fact that you do bring a different perspective. I come from the energy sector, and um, it really is about saying, hey, this is how my knowledge can be additive to what you are looking for in this particular role. Thank you. Just another quick uh, housekeeper reminder. We got seven folks in line. We're probably gonna stop it at that number, so that way we have time for folks to get back with the recruiter. And also, if, we, if our panelists, if maybe just two of you can answer each question, so that way we have time to talk to everyone, that would be ideal. All right, uh, let's go to this side. All right. <clears throat> yeah, I wrote my question down, so um, I'm going to read it. Um, this is regarding DNI, I guess, and attacking from all angles. Uh, as one of you mentioned, how do your companies justify, I guess, that pursuit uh, when sometimes the numbers may not favor going after a specific candidate, say, from school A versus school B or degree A versus degree B? And just for some context, I like volunteered for a recruiting trip last year to Howard University. And I was sad because we didn't really get anybody. And this was for my former employer, so I'm not going to name names. Um, but yeah, how do, you, how do your companies manage that? Did y'all understand the question? No? Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was basically saying, you know, some of the numbers may not favor, you know, an attack from all approaches or, say, going to a specific school. Uh, some, of the, some of the numbers might say, you know, we want candidates from MIT because they may do better or stay longer. Um, so as it, as it pertains to diversity and, and inclusion, how do your companies manage that? Um, coming from uh, uh, another background, another perspective, that's value. <laughs> that's value right there, and that is the reason that, that we continue uh, going to, uh, you know, to different schools and not sticking with uh, the standbys that uh, you know, the tech industry might, might make us go to. You know? Thank you. Talk more about it. 
All right, um, this is kind of a follow-up question to the first question. So how far out does one, or does a company reach out from one sector to another? Like for example, public transportation to let's say marketing or product management, product, project management. I mean, I, I guess that's part of the work, right? It's on both ends. So it's incumbent upon you if you feel like those skills are going to apply to a position you want to reach out and let us know how you're going to apply those skills. Um, on the recruiting side, I think it's incumbent upon them if they want to get those candidates that are good fit for us to look for those people that might be those gems that might not be um, in the regular place where we might expect. And I think um, the teams here are doing a really good job of that or trying to. I definitely played up the fact that I understood how to sell, even though that wasn't my actual job. Um, so, you know, in the film industry, it's basically uh, you, you project to project pretty much, and you have to sell yourself pretty much to every other person, pretty much. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's very, it's a very crazy experience. But me understanding how to get in front of uh, a room of people and network and talk to them about what I could bring to the table was really important. So I learned that in my previous job, and I learned how to. I told them how I could apply that to the job that I was actually applying for. So um, yeah, it just, it just takes a lot of effort on your part to kind of make those two things correlate. Thank you, guys. Gentlemen. Hello, yeah. Uh, so I'm speaking on behalf of a community organization. I have, I guess, a two-parted question. Um, one, we both know, I'm pretty sure there's very many of us uh, minorities in this room that are heavily qualified for positions that they apply for. But racism is still real, even in the Bay Area, as many of us know. Two, um, so what I wanted to know, one, is there a central location that you guys recommend, like a blog or a website that can keep us updated on information and opportunities like this? Because 80% of jobs are not even posted online. People get them because of their friends, associates, and nepotism. So with us working against so many obstacles, is there somewhere that you guys can recommend so that we do know about these type of events and opportunities? One. And two, I like what the gentleman said at the end about the opportunities as far as uh, pre I guess it's sort of like a pre-apprenticeship program for people that were in tech. All this information that you gave us today was a lot. Is there a central place that we can go after this to go look at that? So. I can share that with my constituents. Well, I'll just say that. I just, I just moved out here 10 months ago, but I don't know. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> well, we should talk after this. And we, I think we, we're going to link. Yeah, OK. okay. We're going to link. Cool. We're gonna link. This event is being recorded, so and you'll be able to have access to all this information and share it. I mean, of course, this isn't, you know, that doesn't totally answer your question. But just for the people who couldn't make it tonight who need that information, um, because there's a lot of jewels and nuggets, you know. This event will be recorded and we'll, we'll let you know where it'll be. But um, yeah, we, we definitely encourage you to share that and get this information out. Or just reach out, to, reach out directly, yeah. right? Yeah, just reach out to us in the back or just us up here. Um, I think all of us would be welcome to a message from, from anyone that was looking for information. I mean, I, I guess, in, I'm gonna definitely talk to I, you. I get what you're saying. To rephrase it, is there anything, like, I guess it's game, so to speak, that we were saying in Oakland, like, you know, um, what they're not telling people, but if you take this class and this class, you don't necessarily have to have a degree, but this is what exactly, precisely they're looking for, and that can be a segue into this job, a segue. Because everything really is information on who you know, and our community is not knowing about these opportunities, so it's a lot of people making seventy to $100,000. Okay. I'm a, I like what you did too, sister. That, that's, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate it. I guess the next person can go. Next question is here. Hi, my name is Maya. Um, OK, so you all already answered the question about um, being confident in your interview, knowing what you're talking about, showing that you can do the job. However, I've heard that oftentimes the tech industry the culture can be a little bit cocky, can be overly confident, and they're looking for candidates that can reflect that kind of swag, if you will. So um, in your interview, you want to be really cocky and talk about yourself a lot, and you know, there's logic puzzles and stuff like that. So how much of that is true and how much of that is false? So, uh, no, um, 
I mean, Tell me. I, I mean, I mean, I, there. The perception came from somewhere. What I will say is that we emphasize humility. Not to say you shouldn't go in, you should go in there like, no, 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 no. Um, but no, go in there with an idea of what you want to do, what you want to build, but honestly be humble, right? Um, because there are a lot of people that want that job, and there are a lot of people that can do a good job of it. But we want to really see what it is that you can contribute to make impact. And I remember we have a two-day orientation session, and uh, one of the speakers came in, and has people representing all parts of the business come in, and he said, um, you know, you could come here and think you're a badass and do all that good stuff. Sorry, I said ass. Twice now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, be in here to get glory and be for you. But you know what? We'll find you out. If we don't find you out now, we'll probably find you out in six months and you won't be here anymore. And that stuck with me because there really is a fine line between being capable and being a contributor. And so you have to decide who you want to be. And if the company fits that mold of you wanting to be an arrogant person, then go work for that company. You probably won't do well at Facebook. Yeah, and, you know, I would definitely um, second that. And, you know, what, what you've heard, I think, is the experience of, of one or maybe a few people. Um, you know, I'd encourage you to examine uh, the companies they spoke with. Um, that might provide you with some insight. Um, and, again, um, reach out uh, to people. Um, get um, tips on what the culture is like at certain companies. Uh, many people that you know in, within your network, I'm sure, has known someone else who's worked at those companies. Um, what, what you want to do is um, uh, be yourself in the interview. Um, you know, companies will hire for knowledge, skills, abilities. There are going to be uh, some outliers there who will look for certain attitudes and things of that nature. Although I don't know if, if you know, those things, the cockiness, is, is something that's high on the list. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and those things stand out. Um, there's a, a thing at our company called the no a-hole rule, right? And, and you sense it. You know those things. And those are the types of uh, sort of attitudes we like to stay away from. I know you said only two, but I definitely wanted to say something, mainly because, you know, I love that tech companies are taking on this persona look. You know what? Be humble, not arrogant. You know, that is one of the core tenants, you know, at Medallia, one of our, I guess, employee value propositions. You know, be humble, not arrogant. Relentless forward movement. Dig deep to understand. Put team first, et cetera. But no, one core value of our company is also growth mindset. And a core part of growth mindset is to understand that failures, failures help you. And actually talking about your failures and being open about that, that actually takes you so far. Um, and I think, I don't know, being cocky and, and being open about your failures, uh, I, don't know if they, I don't know if they gel so much. Well, that's good news. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, sorry. Thank you. My name is Jack Chi, and I am a UX designer. And uh, I just graduated from master degree. So my question is, uh, I had great internships. I had built a great product before during those two years. So when I see uh, opening, for example, Facebook on LinkedIn, like requires like three year experience or five year experience, should I consider that a key the apply button or not? <laughs> like. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna tell you straight out that uh, a lot of times job descriptions, they, they are the, the, com the dream combination uh, of skills that a hiring manager believes they need. However, it's, it's quite possible that a person like that doesn't exist. Um, I think one, one thing that we are pushing on doing is doing performance-based job descriptions as opposed to, you know, like previous experience uh, job descriptions, where it talks about what you'd be doing on the job as opposed to what you needed to do before. Um, I think there's a trend uh, towards that nowadays, such that, okay, two years of experience, whatever. We're gonna be building this. We're gonna be solving this problem. Are you up for it? Let's talk. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and you, know, you, you don't know if you're gonna win a race if you don't run it. So send your application in, uh, but don't stop there. Right? You have to look at other avenues to connect with the people that are going to get you in for that interview. All right. Thank you so much.
it looks like everybody asked all the questions I wanted to, but <laughs> I did have another one. Um, you guys mentioned, you know, being curious and wanting to create impact within your organization. Now, and you just also, you also touched on like someone not being the perfect candidate. How do you do you find the candidate that you actually want to invest in that you look in, that you look at and say, you know, they don't have everything, but I see I see potential, and I want to help them grow within this organization. Um, what traits do you look for in that? What What do they have to present? That way? Say something real quick. <laughs> Sorry, I keep I, I keep taking this microphone. I apologize. I love a microphone. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> What I, what I love, and I know that a lot of my colleagues love as well, is bringing in someone who not only has something to learn, but something to teach. We all have something to teach. We're all leaders, you know? And, and I think being able to, to, to exhibit that uh, during the interview process makes, makes us want to learn more. I think if you come in having something to teach, but also something to learn, we can bring everyone up. I would just say practice your pitch. Um, you should be able to speak about yourself in so many different arenas. Um, you should be your own biggest cheerleader. So when you get into that room, uh, you should know exactly how to, I guess, position yourself uh, in that conversation based on the reactions that you're getting from the person who's interviewing you. Um, and so yeah, I think that's always worked best for me. Um, and then people have always just kind of like wanted to, I won't say always, but people have all kind of wanted to invest in me and you know, take an interest in me um, because of that little trait. May, may I add just one quick thing? Uh, you, you brought up a thought in mind. Um, remember, whenever you go in, uh, into an interview and, and you're being interviewed, you also need to interview that person. Right. right? You, you may not be asking direct questions, but through nonverbal cues, and by virtue of the questions that they ask you, tells you a lot. Thank you, Thank you guys. This will be our last uh, question, but just so you know, our panelists aren't leaving. So you'll have an opportunity to ask them questions uh, once this concludes. So you know, make sure you wait to the stage, and I'm certain they'll be open to ta answer more questions. All right. Oh, OK. Thank you, panelists and Mr. Lindsay. Um, so my background is in higher education. I'm a college counselor, and my question relates to transferable skills. Do you know of specific job positions or departments um, at your company that involve transferable skills related to counseling and working with students? Because I'm having a hard time trying to find a position that relates to what I've been doing. I'm hiring someone to help me run uh, university recruiting. Uh, which by nature is about being an advocate for students uh, and someone who understands how university systems run. University recruiting, talk to me. <laughs> I know we're, we're yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, would, I would just add to that, I would say that we're definitely hiring in learning and development. Um, so if you do have like an educational background, building out curriculums and things like that, uh, we definitely have some positions there that are open now. All right, let's thank our panelists, everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight, and I hope this event was enjoyable and informative to all. Um, thank you to our sponsors. Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not done. Got to give a few shout outs. Thank you to our sponsors who made this possible. Adobe, Medallia, Ellie Mae, Lyft, Facebook, App Dynamics, and Uber. Special thanks to the 100 black men of the Bay Area. <laughs> Justin Johnson Photography, the Berkeley High School of Business, and the Oakland Impact Hub for hosting this event in this wonderful space. Again, if you'd like to submit a resume for a review, of course you can give it to any one of the recruiters back there or you can send it to mlindsay at 100blackmenba.org and I'll get it to them all. We'll share with all of our sponsoring organizations. Lastly, please check out the website mtlindsayconsulting.com to find out about upcoming events and to find the video from tonight's event so that way you can share it with the folks who couldn't make it tonight. Now go mix and mingle with all our sponsoring organization recruiters and get yourself a job. <laughs>